So you're flying your aircraft, you're at flight level 370. You're just about to enter some congested airspace and you're about to make a radio call to the area controller and you hear a little chime from your ICAS system and a, a caution message pops up. Hydraulic issue or something like that. You turn to your right hand side and there's no one there to assist with this issue. Does that sound like the world of aviation you want to enter? <laughs> I tell you what, man, uh, this single pilot operations idea hasn't been something that excited me for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, when it first came out, I, st I, I was one of those guys that was ready to call bullshit on it. Still thought, no ways. But in the last couple of weeks, We've seen so much news, and this is gaining traction. And it's, I've been giving it a lot of thought, and it's, I'm starting to realize that that's the way it's going. I'm starting to accept the fact that it's going that way. Whether we like it or not, it's happening. So you're saying that you think despite the unions, so ALPA, the European Corporate Association, International Federation of Airline Pilots, and this coalition that they've put together basically to prevent airlines and manufacturers from pushing ahead with plans to remove pilots from the flight deck. Despite that happening, you think that it is going to happen. Because I do as well. Just want to put that out there. I, you, I, you were the one of the first guys to call this. Uh, you said many, many months ago, you said this is happening. And I still had my doubts. I thought, that, ah, it's too far in the future. You know, maybe my kids' kids will see that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm actually starting to realize that yeah, despite all that, despite all the pushback from industry, from the unions, all of that, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Well, let me paint another scenario. So the one I there at the beginning was all to do with a you're flying your aircraft, you get a a, a non-normal or an abnormal item that you have to deal with, and normally everything, all the training that we've learned since the start of our career, everything's been based on one person flies the aircraft and then one person handles the abnormal item. So you would then turn to your first officer and the first officer would take out the QRH or whatever your company procedure is. But let's say in this case, the first officer is running the QRH. And whilst this is going on, you as the captain are sitting saying, right, what decision may I potentially have to make whilst this whole uh, abnormal checklist is going on. And if you take that situation as a whole, it's a very, very two-person thing. It's a multi-crew environment, and everything we've learned is all based around that, how to work together. I mean, we do, you know, CRM, such a big thing for so long, and now you look at it and say, well, <laughs> it's going to fall away. Yeah. Now, let's have a look at why it might fall away first. And maybe that will, you know, because I think there's a lot of people out there that kind of look at this and say, oh, never going to happen. Never going to happen. Never going to, you know, they're never going to just shut down aviation. They're never going to not allow people to fly out of countries. It's never going to happen. Well, we know that it can happen and it will probably happen again. So you can't just be naive to the fact that the people with the money and the people with that write the legislation, the big manufacturers that are influenced by or that can that has the money to influence government has an inside track to sometimes making the rules that we all have to abide by. Mm. You know, we saw it was clear as day in two thousand early two thousand and twenty. Yeah. So the situation worldwide is that there are simply not enough pilots. There are simply not enough pilots to fly the aircraft so the airlines can make money and the aircraft manufacturers can sell aircraft to these airlines. So we're in this situation where this single pilot operations has been thrown around as a, as a possibility. 
and we've got all the unions and everyone standing up and saying it's not going to happen and we're going to fight this and we're going to stop that from happening. But I think we've all become pretty immune to the fact that these unions, as powerful as they are in some ways, they are also useless in other ways because when it comes to the ultimate decision, the unions just move aside and this is what we're going to do. And that's where I've got something to add, Jack, is, is ultimately this is what you know got me thinking in a different trajectory was the union aspect. I mean, we were told, just take for example, when we were at SS Express, that by virtue of the fact that SS Express was a government-owned airline and we had employed cadets and cadets were necessary to, you know, Drive uh, the, drive the yeah. transformation yeah. agendas, everything. There was no ways that our jobs would ever be unsafe. And you took that as gospel. You had to. I mean, we did. You know, well, it was like ultimately, well, I'll never be uh, in harm's way. And then, uh, and that w- that came from the unions, mm. mostly. Huh? Who were the first people to get let go at uh, yep. the beginning of this hoax? Yep. Uh, so. Ultimately, I realized, well, whatever union says or whatever union tries to do, actually, at the end of the day, they ain't got no say in the matter. If, if the desire is there and that the, 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 the bean counters and ultimately the people behind the scenes uh, insist on this happening because it's going to be what's necessary for the survival of the airline, it's going to happen. So, yeah. yeah, that was what actually got me thinking in a different direction towards this. And you're obviously heavily affected by the fact that, you know, when everything happened, you were left there at home, got no salary, still haven't received a salary from 2020 yeah. when you let go of there. And, and you were heavily affected by this, this whole thing that could never happen, and it did happen. Now, yeah. what I'm saying is, is obviously it's clear as day that this pilot shortage is there. It's not going to be resolved overnight. It's just no, not, not by happen. any stretch of the imagination. And they're going to have to do something to try and sort this out. So let's look at a couple of options. Okay. So the first little scenario I painted was to do with a an abnormal situation that you're trying to fix and you would ordinarily fix that issue in a very much a two crew uh, style of fixing the issue, a multi-crew cooperation. All right. So let's take another example. You know, you've completed your 10,000 foot checklist, whatever it is, you're on the climb and, you know, you look to the your right or your left to say, hey, how was your weekend? And there's no one there. Does the job itself appeal to you a bit less? That then, you know, airline flying, a lot of it can be a bit mundane and boring, but a lot of it is also quite nice when it comes to, you know, what's, you know, let's have a cup of coffee or let's check what's for dinner tonight and have a bit of a chat with your, yeah. you, know, you know, crew member who might be, you might know that person well, he might be from a total different part of the world, different culture. And there's always this sort of a bit of chat to banter that goes on in the flight deck. Hence, why we've tried to add that sort of flight crew banter into the uh, into this podcast. But that, to me, was the best part about flying for an airline. It 1, was that percent. banter. One thousand percent. I mean, you know, thinking back on our careers at at Saks, my best days of flying were when I was flying with someone that I got along well with. Mm. It was 90% of the people that I flew with. You know, we got on like a house on fire. So I really enjoyed my job most of the time. Uh, there were odd, odd few that, that, that made your day long. Yeah. And you would sit there in utter silence. And those were the days that sucked. You'd saw that name on your, on your roster and you would just dread that day's yeah. flying. So yeah, come to think of it, if you have to go and think about sitting for, I don't know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I don't know, I'm 10 hours in the cruise on your ace. There's no ways I'm going to jump at a career like that. So it doesn't appeal to you as much as well? Not to me. Right. So, look, our opinion is it's going to happen. I, I, I fully think that this is going to happen. And regardless of what the unions have to say and, and all the rest, I think it's going to happen. It's probably not going to, it's not going to happen on aircraft that are, you know, the slightly older generation stuff. I'm talking the, the much newer stuff that's coming in. Um, yeah. You can't tell me that they're not going to make the 350 uh, a single pilot flight deck. Um, Boeing are already hinting at, at this for their next... Uh, There's already articles, and you've seen it in some of these uh, items that we're reading, where they're submitting applications, and they've got acronyms for yep. these. Sub- SPOs stands yes. for Single Pilot Operations. Yep. So now some clever oak... Uh, is writing up the regulations. And the minute they've made acronyms, 
Yeah, then it's like real. It's like <laughs> yeah. it's becoming a thing. So yeah, there's another one. Those were uh, reduced crew operations (RCO). Yeah. Uh, so yeah, as you say, acronyms are out already. There's a website out. So the the unions, the pilot union ones, the Star Alliance Pilots uh, a- ASAP. They're called One World Cockpit Crew Coalition and the Sky Team Pilots Association. They have established a website with the domain safety starts with com, And they are starting to highlight the studies that were done all based around it's just simply safer to have two on board. Fine. We agree. Safer to have two on board. There's no question about it. That everything, all our training, everything is based on the fact that you check everything. You don't go and execute something without checking with your pilot monitoring that are you happy with this and a lot of the things as well you know you, you've got to enter into a manual hold somewhere into africa or you know it's nice to bounce that off your pilot monitoring you're happy we're going to turn to the left here and do this and that yeah i firm i'm happy with that it gives you a bit of sense of security that you're doing the right thing but the way i, I suppose they're looking at this and they're saying you know but the aircraft is so modern these days. They've got so much automation built into it. They're so clever. The RCAS and the ECAM systems are so clever that you don't need that pilot monitoring anymore. And if you do need a bit of assistance, if you do need someone to run a QRH item or check something or get the weather for a particular diversion airfield, then there will be someone available to you 24-7 on that flight that can assist you with that information. You simply have to ask for the information that you need. So the arguments, what I'm saying, Ryan, is the arguments are kind of knocked down. Mm. You say, why do you need two crew? Well, you know, you can check this and that person does this. But then they're saying, yeah, but, you know, the, the automation is so good. Why do you actually need that? So I suppose for most people sitting there listening to us now, probably thinking that you and I are like losing the plot and going down some deep, dark rabbit hole. In a nutshell, I suppose, to sort of give this some conjecture and a bit of direction, what we're talking about here is is AI. Mm-hmm. And I guess the, the real reason we are supposedly realizing that this is going to become a thing is because we're paying so much attention to what's actually happening there. Mm. Now, I know you are deeply passionate about this. So, purely because of that? Yeah, I think, you know, AI is, is changing the way we do everything in everyday life. It's, it's created careers in the last month that simply did not exist before. And if you're going to put your blinkers on and think, ah, it's never going to happen, I'm not going to use this technology, you're going to get left behind. And maybe the aviation industry is looking at this and saying, well, if there is a time to push this uh, single crew agenda, maybe it is now. And maybe this was thought out a bit earlier. I mean, uh, we asked last week if a few people could, you know, send us some comments and we got some awesome comments. And what I would say about those comments, Ryan, a lot of the older guys, I'm not talking old, you know, our our sort of age and a bit older, no one's really worried about single crew, we're going to lose our jobs because, you know, everyone's kind of, it might happen. Mm. And, you know, Carl uh, Prucher, I hope I'm mentioning his surname correctly, he brought up a point with the automatic uh, emergency descent function of the A350. You know, if both pilots are incapacitated, the, the A350 will actually do a emergency descent for you. Yeah. And l- little things like this, they're just little hints that these aircraft are actually capable of doing more and more and more. And, uh, you know, if the that functionality is available on the A350, well, you know it's going to be available on the new 321 NEOs and it's probably just a software update. So these things will start to be rolled out with single crew operations. And my concern, obviously, as a fellow pilot, is every time one of these unions that's fighting this to say we must have two people on the flight deck, every time they come up with the reason why, I wonder if the manufacturers and even the authorities will be able to counteract the argument with we've solved that problem, come up with a new argument. And they're going to get to a point where there simply is no argument left. I have no, no, no doubt that that's going to go that way. You know, um, when you mentioned to me the other day Carl's uh, comment that he made, uh, I, I went that evening and I went and searched up some YouTube videos on the A350. I don't know much about the airplane. I would have loved to have had my pause on it at some stage. But 
talking about that automatic descent technology, it's phenomenal. Mm. You get three different options. You can manually engage the emergency descent function. Uh, there's a sort of hybrid function where it will do it semi-automatically and the last function where it will do it fully automatically if both pilots are incapacitated. Um, fascinating uh, topic around that as well is that if you're on an emergency descent, uh, it obviously you know, turns off course, uh, goes down to the lowest of level 100 or the grid more that it detects it's at. But if you end up having uh, a TKAS RA on that emergency descent, it'll automatically fly the RA maneuver as well. That's ridiculous. No, no hands. Eh? Uh, I saw that and I was like, I was just gobsmacked. I was like, well, it's obvious. Yeah. It's so obvious that that's the way it's going. I mean, the only time you really actually need an airplane to get off the ground or hands on is to get the airplane off the ground right now. Yeah. For the most part, it'll fly itself to destination. So, that's why this 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 single pilot operations thing is it's a sure thing, and uh, I don't know. I, I guess we're definitely going to see it within the next ten to fifteen years. I'm sure. Yeah, I think I reckon. I, I think possibly even sooner. I, I really think possibly even sooner. And yeah. look, you've got big people, big people in the aviation industry, uh, you know, vehemently against this. Sally Sullenberger, all the rest. You know. These, I mean, these unions are powerful. Let's, you know, call it as it is. But I'm not so sure that uh, they're going to get this right. We mentioned this last week, this X-Wing submit certification plan for 100% pilotless flight deck technology. So uh, <laughs> the, I, I didn't actually read this article last week. I saw the headline. We mm. mentioned it and said we'll chat about it this week. So... This will allow the company to start operating 100% unmanned commercial cargo flights upon certification. Now, this is already a cargo operator. So these guys are, X-Wing is not this uh, aircraft manufacturer. This is a cargo operator. Yeah. So California-based startup has for several years been working towards FAA certification for its autonomous flight technology. X-Wing runs a Part 135 cargo operation, making some 400 pilots at flights monthly on behalf of UPS. They've got Cessna 208 uh, caravans. The company is working to transition its fleet to fully remote cargo operations. Transition its existing fleet to fully remote cargo operations. They're not buying, they're not buying this new fancy thing that Elon Musk is making mm. and they're going to use that for cargo. They're going to take the caravans and they're going to convert them to yeah. drones. Now, since successfully demonstrating the first fully autonomous autonomous gate-to-gate cargo flight in April 221, X-Wing has logged hundreds of flight hours using its pilot disk technology. The super pilot system is designed to integrate into already type certified aircraft with the goal of introducing uncrewed operations with the existing air traffic control system as we know it today. So, What they're trying to get right is the existing infrastructure around everything else, so ATC, the airways, the approaches, and everything stays as it is. They don't have to change it. And the aircraft that they're flying, the the Cessna, the the caravans, they stay as they are. They're simply integrating this software that's going to do the flying on behalf of the pilots. One area of concern at the moment is that if there's uncooperative traffic, they haven't got this right yet. So this is one of the things that is holding back the FAA certification. So it relies on the fact that all traffic adheres to air traffic control. What happens if there's a uh, unresponsive tra- uh, you know, aircraft out there? Yeah. This won't be able to, to accommodate that. Um, another is a possibility of the aircraft losing satellite connections during a critical phase of flight such as final approach so it uses obviously gps to help it fly the approach they're also developing a vision based system in case of that so similar to what they have on the teslas that's got a whole whack of cameras and the cameras actually pick up information if they see a little person that's uh, kids going to run across the road the camera actually picks it up it'll break for the tesla well this type of technology they're trying to put into this system as well. Funny, you know, when when Elon is making those cameras for the Tesla, I've got a hell of a lot more faith that that 
that system is going to work than I do when this uh, little cargo operation called X-Wing is making those cameras themselves. Like, who's making that camera? Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. not coming from the flea market. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you kind of want to know. But yeah. look, this is a this is a huge thing, and it's. Uh, have applied for the certification uh, you know this is pilotless this is not single pilot yeah so but listen i mean again it's plausible you know they're putting people in rocket ships sending them to the international space station autonomously mm. fully autonomously so i mean if you can get a vehicle to leave earth go into space and get back yeah without any human assistance you know how difficult is it to get to to fly an airplane from, from Jovic to Durban. Take off and land itself. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why I find this, this this aviation space is funny, man, because during the pandemic phase, cargo pilots were the safest pilots. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah the <laughs> they safest the guys that had the jobs. Yeah. But this kind of poses a bit of a threat. Now, I'm not trying to sound negative or anything, but it's 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 a reality. Yeah. You know, th- the cargo companies are the first ones to benefit from this type of technology. So it's going to be very interesting to see where this goes. Yeah, it is. Just one last bit to sort of counteract this and something I read the other day and it's something I've heard from a few people. Uh, there's someone commented on a, a message to me on Instagram about it was, you know, with these drones and that off, that are flying around for the militaries, there's a hell of a lot of people that are required on the ground to actually get this drone to actually fly. Yeah. And as far as I know, it's more than two people. So you've got two people flying an aircraft, and suddenly now you need four people on the ground to operate this drone. So it's not just a case of, you know, this X-Wing story. You, you might find they might get certified, but you have to have four pilots on the ground monitoring each aircraft fly. Yeah. Then obviously they're not going to use that technology, but I just think that that's a you know something that's there to maybe push the agenda of the single pilot side. So you can you you get the authorities saying, listen guys, listen you, unions, you either just wind your neckens on this, otherwise we're going to go to f- 100% pilotless technology, which is also about to be certified. So what do you want? You know, so it's an argument and it's it's something that we bring up on the show not to you know, be negative about it, but mm. also to bring to the attention of, you know, what's going on around there. And there's no question that, they, that, you know, there's people sitting in boardrooms at the moment that are looking at the next 10, 15, 20 years and, and maybe pilots don't factor in too much into, the, into the, the case, you know. Well, that's what we're about, you know, in this podcast. You know, we're about aviation. We're about technology. And this particular subject is kind of where the two sort of merge. Yeah, Technology is going to impact aviation heavily going forward. Um, And, you know, in a way, I I kind of almost see it making sense where you could have single pilot operations and you have these little stations where there are backup drone pilots. You know, you don't have to position crew... You know, you get you get you can do it four standby home. pilots in Petri Tif yeah. and goes to the local <laughs> yeah. drone pilot station there and you yeah. can be back up for whatever. You know, yeah. I'm exaggerating, but that's the future. Mm-hmm. And uh yeah, that's what makes this uh this conversation so interesting. Man. Yeah. Certainly not a subject that I even would have looked at had we not had the podcast, but it's something that obviously we need to keep an eye on. But anyway, yeah. I hope you enjoyed that uh, story of the week. Let's get into some OEM news, some good news for Boeing for a change. They outperformed Airbus in the first quarter of 2023. Yeah, who would have seen that happen? Yeah, did not see, uh, <laughs> foresee that. Boeing surpassed Airbus in net orders. So uh, the majority of which, 111 of them were for the 737 MAX. And uh, 11 787s, four trip sevens, all freighters, and a single 767 300 freighter. And the last ever, of course, 747 to Atlas Air. So Boeing had a really, really good first quarter. And then they go and end it off by stuffing up another manufacturing <laughs> issue. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the Max, of course. Oh jeez. So they just they just as soon as they get something right, they go and they, they get it wrong. So obviously non conforming to fuselage components. Uh, was the the cause of the whole thing. It's got something to do with the vertical tail attaching to the fuselage. 
and they expect to see inspections and fixes to take a meaningful amount of time. So Ryanair have already gone out and had to assess this whole, you know, how's it going to affect them? I think Ryanair, of, uh, they, they are, Airframe has moved to pause delivery of some 737 MAX jets and it goes on to say here, yeah, this was from uh, Flight Global. Ryanair is due to take 24 more Boeing Max jets before the end of June. Jeez. 24 just before the end of June. They already operate 53 of them, of course. And a lot of this employment drive and everything that's going on, they're doing, you know, they've been in South Africa this past week. Uh, yesterday, there yesterday. we go. Yesterday. Yeah. And they've, they're going, they, they're trying to take pilots on basically to fly these Maxes that are supposed to come. So obviously that might be delayed a little bit. Boeing went on the defense to say, look, it's not too much of a major problem. Just, you know, stand by for a sec. We'll get, we'll sort the problem out. Yeah. But nevertheless, Boeing, whenever there's some positive news followed by some negative news that their CEO even took a bit of a hit to his bonus. He didn't make his uh, numbers on the 777X front. So the board took his bonus away. So they flew, he fluffed his KPI. His KPIs KPI. didn't didn't meet the performance that they were supposed <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But uh, yeah, so the main news there, nice to see that Boeing are back in the game in terms of deliveries. Airbus, most of the deliveries were all narrow body, 320s and 321s as you'd expect. And obviously it's a little bit lopsided. Airbus have been making deliveries, you know, every month. Yeah in the pandemic whereas uh boeing just simply weren't able to with uh, the both the max and the 787 so obviously it's a little bit lopsided but good to see airbus back in it they delivered 127 jets in the first quarter uh 10 to 20 300s two a319 neos 45 320 neos and 59 321 neos only delivered 11 wide body aircraft which may be a, a another conversation for another time. Yeah. It's always narrow bodies, very few wide bodies being sold. And in Airbus's defense, I think most of the issues have been um, supply chain issues. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it's not completely self-inflicted no, on true. their part. But uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes through out the rest of 2023 for them. We mentioned the roadshow, Ryan. Any news? Anyone you know went? Uh, I actually haven't spoken to anyone that's been to the Ryanair Roadshow, to be honest with you. Uh, well, I suppose it's just uh, I've been I've been exceptionally busy. So Roadshows, uh, you can take your pick at the moment. Uh, yeah. The Ryanair one was here in South Africa, but there's virtual... Virtual Cathay, uh, virtual uh, Hong Kong or Hong Kong Express, one of yeah. those. Sorry, uh, um, there's too Hong many. Hong Kong Express. Kong, yeah. Was there, I think, are was there? coming back. Yeah. There's... Was there on a massive drive for pilots, yeah. Yep. Um, they're all over the place. If you look at any recruitment site, they're there. ATNS is hiring again. Yeah, well, ATNS are in desperate need for it. ATCs, and we we spoke about it a few sh shows back. I mean, <sighs> air traffic controllers worldwide. I think Big uh, there's a shortage. Yeah. So if you ATNS website, you can go check out the job opportunities of that. Yeah. If that tickles your fancy, so uh, an option there. But basically. These road shows, pick and choose and pick carefully. Be careful. Don't go somewhere that you don't want to go. Mm. Um, uh, I think a lot of these airlines are, you know, they bullshit their way into it, to be honest. They've, and I'm obviously not going to mention the people's names, but we got a lot of information. You know, we did put out a call to say, hey, please send us a message, you know, comment. Let us know what you think about the single pilot stuff, but let us know, you know, where you are in the world. And so many people got to us and said, you know, you know, you guys mentioned this about that company, and let me tell you why they are on such a big recruitment drive, and and this is why. And yeah, a lot of the times you you hear this stuff and you just it makes you mad because pilots around the world are still actually being treated rather poorly if you think about it and you compare it to other industries that are also in need of, you know, skilled yeah. workers. Yeah, I think that actually that, that, that comment came from uh, one of our listeners with regards to uh, one of the poor performing um, 
on time performance on time performance airlines yeah one of the the worst on time performing (laughs) airlines (laughs) (laughs) yeah and and the reason for that was largely due to uh crew shortages Mm. and then you know the reasons behind that just became glaringly obvious and it was oh what do you expect Mm. so yeah i mean choose carefully and go stay somewhere in the world that you know your whole family actually wants to go wants to stay and it does fit in with your existing lifestyle and somewhere where you can see yourself long term don't want to go through that whole move a move is not easy and then be there for a year and then have to pay back your training bond and then go somewhere else it ends up becoming a bit of a nightmare so rather hang tight until you found something you, you really want yeah i suppose you know in saying that as well I think we're going to see at some point here in South Africa for those that aren't in a hurry to leave the shores of South Africa, there's mm-hmm. going to have to be some sort of turnaround here in terms of the way pilots are taken care of. Mm-hmm. So it might end up in the in the long run Good being worth your while staying here, although it's not easy to at the moment given all the <laughs> yeah. issues that everyone's going to no, deal with. Thanks, ANC. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows that might change i mean let's stay positive on that now. yeah well uh yeah as you say staying positive is what it's all about let's go to some international airline news so a few dodgy incidents this past week eh? heavy 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 like heavy, heavy. heavy landings and yeah <laughs> cats are damaged an a350 and a tail strike i think i was on landing actually yeah when they did a go around they came back landed was fine uh hard landing for cargo lux yeah scraped an engine pod scraped an engine four. yeah badly also yeah. Did it go around? Saab 340 runway excursion and uh, Eva Air uh, 321 collided with a uh, Eva Air 777. Yeah. I wonder if those pilots love their jobs. <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, that was a, yeah, a few dodgy incidents. Did you see that Cargo Lux video? Yeah, no, it was, it was insane. I mean, jeez. Yeah. I wonder uh, if he hit a downdraft or something. It flattened that thing into the ground. One of my mates sent me that video. Uh, by WhatsApp, I still replied. I said, there's, the, there's a couple of crew that are definitely going to the boss's office for coffee the next <laughs> Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, that's oh. for sure. Uh, Aussies, they're going to face a 50% pay hike to fly to Europe. Aussies are up in arms about this. Why is that, though? I didn't read that. Yeah, they're facing fares almost 50% higher than the same period last year as airlines keep prices high despite the supply of available seats and fuel prices improving in recent months. I suppose. So. Also, makes sense. Australia's fucking far away, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Do your boots on the ground thing again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. So between European destinations such as London, Paris and Milan for travel between the beginning of June and end of September has grown to 2,571 USD. So figures mark 46% increase on average airfares for the European summer from 222 and are 63 above comparable pre-pandemic fares. So it's pretty high. Jeez. Yeah, steeper. Yeah. So, yeah, not not good news for the Aussies there. But nonetheless, uh, technology breakdown again for Southwest. (laughs) As as, as if they didn't learn from the first round. They got a dodgy IT department there. (laughs) So a vendor-supplied firewall went down and connection to some operational data was unexpectedly lost. Not the first time Southwest has had problems with its information technology systems. So, airline, remember that first one? 16,700 flights were cancelled. Because of that uh, issue that they had. Obviously, there was weather and a few things, but ultimately, it was the IT system that uh, let them down. Yeah, one would think that uh, they, pretty they, crazy. they would have addressed that, you know, with with a bit of speed. Yeah. And given that some serious attention because, man, it costs them millions, eh? It costs them big bucks every time they have an IT issue. Yep, it does. Uh, let's go to this story because this one kind of ties into our story of the week. Nearly 500 regional jets are parked in the USA because regional carriers don't have enough pilots. Mm. 500 airplanes times two crew. That's 1,000 pilots needed for one sector. 
every airplane does an average of four sectors. That's already 4,000 pilots. Sorry, I'm doing some rough maths. Yeah. Because I'm exceptionally you good plan, at it. You didn't plan this beforehand. No. <laughs> so <laughs> that's at least four to 6,000 pilots, give or take. Yeah. Shortage. Yeah. Hey? That's, that's nuts. And, you know, it sort of weighs into the argument that we were speaking about, 500 aircraft. I mean, put that into perspective. So it's mainly of the regional jets and storage, 312 are bo- Bombardier CRJ 900s, 700s and 200s, so our old workhorses, 31s, Dash 8, eight uh, Q400s, and 140 Embraers, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, 140s and 145s and E-Jets. Pretty, pretty amazing. And that article goes on to say the regional airline industry in America is at risk of collapse because there's no one to fly these aircraft. And that whole regional setup. So how the regionals work in the States is a little bit different, yeah? Yeah. They, they've got, they got obviously do the flying for the big flagship carriers. So Delta, United, American, they all have their regionals attached to them to fly passengers to the hubs where the international flying happens. So no one to fly the people to the hubs. It's crazy. 500 aircraft is a lot of aircraft. We weren't talking like this two years ago, pal. No. Hey. No, that, but, but in a way, yeah. how cool is that? It's amazing. I mean, it's amazing. There were 500 parked aircraft. You know, they were, it was just total, total chaos. Now, 500 aircraft because there are simply no pilots. It's insane. So you walk in there with a the pilot's license and say, I want to fly your CRJ 900. I'm rated. Yeah. They'll take you if you can spell airplane. <laughs> yeah, I know where they can find a couple of CRJ nine hundred pilots, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, pretty pretty crazy if you think about it. That uh, Air France four four seven crash trial, Airbus and Air France acquitted. Yeah, uh, d- 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 <laughs> when did that crash happen? That was. You ask a good question there, Ryan. Yeah. So that was first uh, d- 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 of June two thousand and nine. Airbus 330, of course, Rio to Paris. Poor flying, misidentification of what was going on. But, uh, yeah, Airbus and Air France. It wasn't, you know, Airbus, pitot tubes, mm. you know, that old story. So it's taken just short of 14 years to conclude. Yeah, that, that's, why, that's why I thought it was news. Yes. I had no idea that this trial was going on. I, yeah. I didn't know. I thought that... Uh, I uh, watched that MH370. How was movie it on Netflix? Series on Netflix this weekend. Watch, by chance. I watched half the first episode. I haven't got any further. So I sort of binge watched it. Uh, you know, I was busy with the kids in between. But uh, man, um, it was like a lot of it wasn't stuff that we hadn't seen or heard of before. Uh, there were some things that I realized that I, I would now call bullshit on. But I, I still can't believe that 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 airplane hasn't been found or those fragments that have been found allegedly that belong to it. That's all bullshit. I'm sure of it. Yeah. But um, why you say that? Just based on what you saw on that. Uh, I think so. That Netflix. You know, look, there there were so many different angles to that story. It's it's, it's well worth the watch. I must say because it gets you thinking. But that happened in 2000. And 2000, uh, uh, so I've just gone away from that. Shucks. Let me find it. Wasn't yeah. that long ago? 2014. Yeah. 2014. Yeah. So almost 10 years ago. And there's <laughs> just, will that ever be concluded? Mm. Will that ever, uh, that's still the, the world's biggest aviation mystery. I think if it was going to be concluded, it would have been already. Yeah. Frightening. Very. Frightening scenes in Sudan. Heavy. I don't One like of your that, favorite eh? places. Yeah, I spend a lot of time there in contract. Well, I won't say a lot of time. I was there for a while. <laughs> but um, I, I'm really, really concerned for all the contract crews that are there right now. So the contract crews stuck there? Stuck. Can't move. Airport's closed. There's missiles and bombs and all sorts of shit going on. Airport's closed. The, the, there was a allegedly a, a, a 24-hour ceasefire agreement put in place, mm. which they didn't adhere to. So, yeah, well, uh, no surprise there. Nobody can plan to fly in there to, to, to rescue their citizens. The Germans turned around. They chickened out. Hmm. Germans backing out of a fight. 
<laughs> have you ever? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, strongs to the guys that are stuck there at the moment, and I hope that uh, everybody manages to get out fairly soon. Yeah, that's not a good situation. Aircraft, the uh, some air, a lot of aircraft damaged, and like you say, people stuck there is not good. Aircraft flying, you know, have to bypass that airspace or flying around that space at the moment. Yeah. Sean Mendes was on uh, BBC Radio, I think, this morning, I, I heard. And, yeah, they were talking about the airlines will, you know, it's, it's extra money. It's extra flight time. 20 minutes flight time, doesn't matter what it is. Eventually, if they don't sort it out, obviously that uh, extra flight time, the money it costs to fly the extra track miles, of course, it goes into the out of the consumer's pocket. I think and most then, airlines are more worried about the flight and duty at the moment yeah. to the pilots because they <laughs> yeah. because they're stretched on crew than they than they are about fuel prices. But yeah, all those factors taken into account, it's not cool. I've just thought of something right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna go back to our story of the week. Pilots are flying their asses off lately. A lot yeah. of guys are unhappy. There's um there's a lot of happiness around there. A lot of people very happy, content to have their, their jobs that they didn't have a few years ago and you know a lot, uh, the majority of the people we speak to are happy however being th- these podcasters that we are and, no- and people knowing that you know what we talk about each week people do contact us and they tell us that hey uh, it's no sunshine rainbows out here and th- there's people that are very very unhappy both here in South Africa at local airlines and overseas like guys, are, guys and girls are flying very hard, very long days, unplanned, rosters aren't stable, can't plan ahead, puts strain on your family's lives, puts strains on people's marriages and all sorts of things, unhappiness. And we're talking about single crew operations. What happens if they come and they say, okay, right now you're flying 120 hours a month. If we say single flight, single flight crew operations you only allowed to fly 70 hours a month would you take it so you can fly 120 joule two crew but what happens if they say to get this certified you're only allowed to fly 70 hours a month meaning of course you have more off days more days at home with your family maybe slightly longer turnarounds where you can actually rest on the other side of the world yeah would you take it as opposed to what's going on now? I'm ju- I didn't think about this before the podcast. No, 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 I've no, just thought the, about it now. No, and, and that's what so. makes it very interesting to think about it off, off the bat. You know, it's like, would you take it? I suppose, <laughs> look, for most guys, I suppose most guys would take it in a heartbeat. It's going to suck. You're going to sit there on your ace. But so what? There's, there's, you've, got, you've got your iPod, listen to some <laughs> ACDC for 70 hours, yeah. 100% catch yeah. up on some reading, whatever. Yeah. I suppose it would suit a lot of guys because, I mean, 120 hours is a, a lot. It's 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 taxing. Like you say, on the family life, if you've got more time off at home, I, th- I suppose more, most guys would would definitely take it in a heartbeat. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is if you, the the article we read now: 500 regional aircraft parked in America. Mm. Obviously, the single pilot side, you're going to have the captains flying the the heavies and flying at the the main carriers. Yeah. Then you can have all the younger FOs flying the regionals around. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> and, and you know what? <laughs> kind of like it would solve a big problem that the world is having. Is You know we are saying? You've got this wealth of experience on one spectrum yeah. and then all these juniors coming in straight from flight school. Yeah. That would give them <laughs> all the command time <laughs> they need. Yeah, they'd be, they'd be so well versed at being commanders. <laughs> but uh, no, I just thought about it at the time. You know, there's, it, it's, it's not all... You know, sunshine rainbows. So no, it's not like. Listen, pilots will moan regardless. Oh, they will. A pilot will moan if they're flying twenty <laughs> hours yeah. a month usually. No, but, but you have to. It's part of the culture. Yeah, you, yeah. you have to moan a little bit. Exactly. Makes it all worthwhile. All not, right. Not 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 good news for someone who's running a CRM school, eh? Because like, 
How are you going to do a CRM course? No, Ryan, it's aviation. Yeah. They'll just change it. They'll change it. Won't be CRM anymore. It'll be you'll be doing single your pilot operations. You're doing your you have SPO to do course an or whatever. Integration with artificial intelligence course. Exactly. So that'll become a thing. That's a thing. That's already <laughs> an acronym now. That's going to be added in. <laughs> <laughs> How to talk to your robot? Yeah. <laughs> Trademarked on the Brown Air podcast. Yeah. Is your robot woke enough? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, shit. Yeah. All right, African news. Uh, yeah, let's get to it. Nigeria Air, they're ready to launch, says Ethiopian Airlines. Um, <laughs> they're ready to launch, except the major carriers there are all saying, nah, that's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> Nigeria just, Air is like our SA. Don't we call bullshit on that most of the time? But this is this is a legitimate thing. But, you know, Airpeace, Max Air, United Nigeria... You know they've they all putting their they they saying this was not done correctly <laughs> and it's going to affect our business rightly so yeah so they trying to stop it from happening then another article comes up airline startup of the week Nigeria NG Eagle and you know not confirmed yet by Nigerian CIA but they trying to get an AOC and they have taken over the assets from. What was the, the main carrier there again? I forget. Uh, Eric. Eric. Yeah. Oh, I've never heard of NG Eagle. No, me neither. But this is, uh, and uh, what I find <laughs> funny about this article and why it goes hand in hand with the uh, Nigeria Air one is the new airline is set to either compete with a pot uh, potentially replace incoming flag carrier Nigeria Air. Potentially replace incoming flag carrier Nigeria Air. Another Nigerian startup claims to have received its AOC. And uh, it is in the running to act as a national carrier <laughs> following litigation preventing Nigeria Air from taking to the skies. It's a new startup airline and it's, uh, as I said, uh, formed partially from assets belonging to Eric Air. Prospective carrier is a 53 million US dollar startup project by the state-owned asset management, state-owned asset management corporation. Well, that says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't look. Yeah, you turned me off at state owned. Um, yeah. yeah, anything state owns a fucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Rwanda Air they starting services to Paris. Apparently, Paris a big market for the people of Rwanda. That's so good. That's good. It's a new option for us as well. Exactly. You, you took to the words out of my mouth. That's good. And that'd be another connection from us to Charles de Gaulle. Good job. Nice. Uh, there was a mile how. Mile ha wank on Fly South Air. I was wondering if we were going to talk about this <laughs> one today. <laughs> Look. Oh, oh shit. shit. A couple's banned from booking flights on Fly South Air after they were reported to have engaged in a sexual act aboard a flight <laughs> from uh, Joey's to Derbs. So are we against this or <laughs> no, no, no. for it? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm all for the opportunist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just but don't I get mean, caught. Yeah, don't get caught. Businessman, a businessman complained about the couple's activity. He claimed that the woman had her hand in her partner's pants while the plane waited to take off. The man who filmed the activity alleged that he could not leave his seat for safety reasons and the couple's activity, which included kissing and giggling, continued while the aircraft took off. The businessman sounds like a bit of a... Um, <laughs> He, he said as soon as he could leave his seat, he reported the incident to the air hostess. The businessman added that he expected the police to get involved. I laughed at this. Uh, uh, Fly Safe Air Chief Marketing Officer Kirby Gordon said the company condemned lewd and indecent acts. Yeah, well, of course he's <laughs> going to say that. But I mean, I can just imagine, I, I've seen Kirby Gordon out and he, he looks like a nice guy and he's, he looks like he's uh, you know good for a bit of a laugh. So I could see when he... This issue landed on his desk, and now he had to make a, a formal statement. It must have been a bit of a how do I how do I keep a straight face on this one? <laughs> I suppose you got to yeah say yeah. what needs to be said, but take I mean, it with a pinch day. of lube. But I saw <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, when I read it, I just thought, just yes, go, boy, you know, yeah, shit, hundred percent. I mean, but look, man, if you're gonna do it, then don't do it on a low cost. Yeah, well, like, <laughs> if that's what he got in a low cost, imagine what he would get if flying on business. <laughs> 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 I suppose he's got to test the waters and uh, start somewhere. You know. Yeah. 
yeah. it is the middle of the month, so he's clapping it on a budget. Yeah. It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah true. <laughs> uh, SIA news we're not going to talk about because whatever. <laughs> um, Brown advisory. Yeah. Ready for it. All right. So, AI. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. We, we have to talk about it. We have to you know, tell our listeners what we yeah. see, what, what's going on. And it, it is such a major subject. And obviously, every new bit of tech that is coming out at the moment has AI in it. So, it's very hard not to, you know, we, it's not necessarily about chat GPT, but this one, AI in general. Yeah. And I'll leave the link in the show notes, but there's a podcast doing the rounds at the moment, which is a Joe Rogan podcast interviewing Sam Altman. But it's not Joe and it's not Sam Altman. It's a computer-generated Joe and a computer-generated Sam Altman. There's two episodes in two. that podcast. And the other one is? Donald Trump. Donald Trump, yeah. It is. And Donald Trump is, sounds... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Donald Trump sounds like Donald Trump. I mean, yeah, but it's freaky. It's freaky, yeah. And the, the reality with this, you take someone like Joe Rogan, he's got so much airtime through his, you know, I don't know, nearly 2,000 three-hour long podcasts yeah. that the, the AI systems and these large language models are so good at asking Joe Rogan type questions or answering a Joe Rogan type question based on what he's answered before in the past. Yeah. So all this information plugged into these systems, he actually... They haven't quite got the voice 100% right, but the the language that they that he's the way he's answering the question and how he's answering the question is is very realistic to what we we get from Joe yeah. on the, at the moment on his existing podcast. And just to make you aware of how easy this actually is, I actually built an AI generated podcast of you and me because we have lots of hours of our voices saved on the internet doing a podcast now this was done it didn't take me long to do i took the, the data off the net and i basically i made a fake version <laughs> of a brian air podcast of you and me can i show it to you quickly let's have it all right let's have it so here it is hey pal how are you doing cuz i'm good thanks ryan it has been a busy week as always i have had lots of simulated training on the go and a few early mornings but i'm strong this podcast is the best part of my week although i wouldn't mind nipping out quickly for a pint and some chicken fingers i hear you pal but we have to watch our figures with this much air time on the brian air podcast we can afford to look like a state-owned enterprise board <laughs> member you mean a fat cat that's exactly what i mean Who's going to win the F1 GP next weekend? You know me. I support Max all the way, but would like to see an improvement from the Ferraris. Same here. I think this will be a great year for F1. As always, pal. Love doing this show with you. It's always a gas cuz. Until next week. Bye for now. Cheers, folks. And remember, don't be a deuce. <laughs> 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 so I had a bit of fun putting that together. But the, the reality is that's not Ryan and I speaking at all. But that is, that is AI generated voice of myself and you into a written conversation and that's version 1.0 and can you imagine version 3.0 <laughs> in a year's time or two years time it'll be indistinguishable indistinguishable so the brown air advisory for this episode is a very very important one yeah. don't believe everything you hear and don't believe everything you see from now on because you literally, and I don't know how they're going to do it, and this is why AI is so dangerous because of that. How do you distinguish between what's real and what's not real? And the reality is the things are getting so close. And I know that there's a few things off there and, you know, you can pick it up. But it does sound like me, although a computer version of me, and it yeah. certainly does sound like you. So you can imagine when that technology gets a bit better, Man, oh man, if you believe everything, you know, uh, it, we've seen it already. If yeah. you're going to sit and, you know, look at, C, uh, watch CNN and all that bullshit that goes on there and BBC and all these things, it's it's all lies. A lot of it is bullshit yeah. already. But now with this added stuff, you take someone you do believe, like you do trust, like a person like Joe Rogan. Yes. 
and you, hey, but Joe's got this opinion and that maybe it changes your opinion because of the fact that Joe's opinion was that, but it wasn't Joe. Yeah. That's dangerous. It is dangerous. And, and, and you know, like I'm excited about AI, but I'm very <laughs> nervous yeah. about it at the same time. Uh, yeah, it's going to make our jobs as podcasters. We don't really know what it's going to do, do yeah, we? We, yeah, but we just, let's just make a promise right now that, you know, as long as it's us, Tina's, yeah. we'll be real yeah. 100% of the time. Yeah. Um, so if you hear lots of ums and ahs and mistakes and naming the wrong airline and the wrong aircraft, of you know it's th the real Brian yeah. and Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> if it's very you know, well orchestrated, clean, neat, and everything is correct, it's probably AI yeah. that's uh, yeah. doing the pod and not Computer us. Computer nerd. Yeah. Not us. But how's that, eh? So, so, yeah, as I say, don't believe everything you see here because it might not actually be the person that you think. And <laughs> it, it's so amazing, the technology that's out there. And it literally took me five minutes to put that little uh, fake podcast of you and me together, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah, and it's insane. Yep. Yeah, like you say, version 1.0, who knows where it's going to, I mean, because things are just happening so quickly now. Yeah. This time next year, it could be a whole different ballgame. Yeah, so I'll leave a link in the notes. The, the, a good video to watch is an Unbox Therapy video where they talk about this uh, Joe Rogan episode and basically go yeah. through it. and It's a good one. Check it out. As always, Paul, nice to be here in the studio with you. Hey, guys, that was a, that was a gas. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a doers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a lucky one. We'll have to teach the AI some uh, South African slang swear words. Yeah. What do they call it? Vernacular. Vernacular. Oh. oh, you see. My big word for the week. Good one. <laughs> <laughs>